What's going on, everyone? Today we're here with Nathan Fluella. Now, this brother has traveled the world. He's traveled about 60 countries so far. He has a show as well, uh, chronicling his travels. And, you know, Nate, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right. So, Nate, you know, traveling and, and even just starting to get passports for a lot of African-Americans is something new. So I read that you're from Chicago, correct? Yes, from the south side of Chicago. South side of Chicago. So how did you go from coming from the south side of Chicago to saying, man, I want to start traveling the world? Oh, it's an interesting story. My mother, as a, as a child, my mother would go on missionary trips with the church. So she's been, uh, when I was a teenager, she had been to Brazil four times, or maybe five times. She's been to South Africa, Egypt, Italy, a few places in the Caribbean. And I had family members that played basketball overseas. I had a cousin who spent one summer in college in Greece, and I have a cousin who's always lived overseas working, and he's currently living in Macau right now as the vice president of entertainment at the Venetian. So for me, fortunate enough for me, I had family members that were always traveling out, out, outside of the country, but for me, I always felt that's what you do when you become an adult. So um, when I was in college at Tennessee State University, I had met a professor uh, Dr. Galen Hall, when I was taking his international economics class, he just he took a liking to me and he had uh, challenged me to see more countries than him when he gave me his autobiography, which he documented his travels to over 80 countries. So when he challenged me, it was like planting the seed or watering the seed because my family members had planted the seed over the years. And I had just thought like, OK, I'm of the age where I can make that decision for myself and go travel the world. So now you travel in the world and, and people that probably knew you from the south side of Chicago, uh, what, what do they say to you when they hear you, you traveling all over the place? Well, at first it was it was a new thing, the whole blogging community and, and YouTubing and, and blogging. So I, I give you some examples. When I, The first time I went back to I had moved away from Nashville and I went to homecoming and I had it was probably like oh nine. And then people, I was telling people what I'm doing. They're like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. It was like, okay, yeah, but good luck with that. I hope it works out for you. And then three years later, when I came back uh, in 2012, it was just like, oh, Worldwide Nate, you know, man, we love what you're doing. They're supportive. And it just was, um, it was a support of what I was doing because they saw how I was, I was representing them when I was traveling and then how the way my storytelling, I was always making them inclusive of the, of the journey with me. It wasn't, Oh, look at this is what I'm doing. You guys are on the south side or you guys are in the States or you guys are, you know, doing your thing, in your little neighborhood. I'm over here traveling the world. I always want to take an approach of being aspirational and inspirational to where it's like, hey, this is what I'm doing. You can do it, too. And then when you decide to do it, this is how you can do it. And if you or I can help you and give you information on how to do it yourself. Yeah, no, because a lot of people, you know, ask that question, especially, you know, definitely a lot of African-Americans say, OK, I got my passport. But what's really expensive, especially when they want to travel to African nations and maybe you can give some tips and pointers how to travel to African nations um, and not really break the bank as much because, you know, we are definitely open to tips. Yeah, well, the, the Internet has changed the game and social media, so a lot of airlines I haven't figured it out, but I think they run these glitch fairs on purpose where you can catch these $600, $800 round trip tickets to Africa or, or the Middle East. So it's become more economical. I mean, even South African Airways, I work with them a lot, and uh, they had on a, a fair on their website where you can fly a round trip for $800 to Johannesburg from, from New York or D.C. And, you know, that's pretty affordable as opposed to back in the day. It's always been that sticker shock of, fifteen hundred two thousand dollars and those are more so like the price you'll pay for you can still pay that for coach economy seats now but sometimes you can get those type of seats for first class but uh so so the airlines are actually helping help making it more affordable to travel to these african nations because what's happening also is that the tourism is growing in these african countries so what you what you have is you have more of a demand because people want to go there and they're being they're becoming more aware of the opportunities to enjoy Africa. So all these different industries are working together to, to be able to be competitive in a global space because they're missing out on money. People are traveling all around the world, going to Southeast Asia, South America, Europe, and, and people want to travel to Africa. But the barrier of entry and then the mis misconceptions of Africa 
are are dwindling, you know, and, it, and you know that's what the purpose of my show too is to do is just demystify travel to to Africa for the average American millennial. Right, and let me ask you a question about being a you know African American. The moment you, moment you left outside the U.S. and let's say you went to a different country, did you feel that you carry more weight outside the U.S. being an African American than within the country? I definitely do. I, you know, we we are our biggest export. The America's biggest export is hip hop. <laughs> it's global. So, but then a lot of African Americans will get the chance to travel. So people are just fascinated with African Americans. So when they get the opportunity to meet us in person, it's just um, it's almost like rock star treatment. You know, it's like our black skin is, is black equity. And not to say that, you know, traveling around the world is perfect and everybody's going to lay out the red carpet for you. But from my experience, I've had um, great experiences just meeting new people. But at the, but all in addition, my whole approach is that I want to learn your culture. I want to, you know, discover, you know, like uh, I want to become friends and, and just learn the culture, taste the food. And I'm a sponge and I'm very like open and embracing of other people as well. So it's just really that energy that you put out makes a difference no matter what your ethnicity is. But I think with, with black folks, we have a uh, special charm about ourselves that, that goes a long way. Right. So what country have you traveled to that you could say that, you know, the moment you got there, you know, they knew you was African-American. It was like, wow, man, I, man, they treated me the best. What country? Now that is a, that's a good question. Um, well, like to say outside of Africa, I would say outside of Africa, because once you're in Africa, you really, until you speak, you know, for the most part, you know, you just, you look like another African. Uh, you blend in well. But I would say in Europe, I, I would probably say Spain. I was in Barcelona, that was the first country I went to. And I really, that really like solid, cemented my travel bug and my wanderlust. So uh, I would say Barcelona and, and Spain and then San Sebastian. I went to Sp San Sebastian in Spain. San Sebastian and Barcelona on my first trip out of the country. Okay, so you didn't have a language issue, or you knew Spanish. Well, I was I was studying Spanish at that time, but um, pretty much like in Europe, a lot of a lot of those countries they speak English as well. Like they'll have their 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 native tongue, but then they're familiar with English. Or Barcelona is one of those international cities where you can find a lot of of, of, of English speaking people because you have the English speaking people from the UK that come to that uh, relocate to Spain and just the tourists and then just English being the common common language of the world these days. Yeah, because we were in Ethiopia, you know, I was quite shocked that they were speaking Amharic, but also a lot of them knew English. I mean, they were speaking in English to me and I thought, oh, man, because, you know, Ethiopia, they don't, that's not the, you know, English is not the main, you know, language of, of that country. But, yeah, everybody knew English. And, and, and when I was doing a lot of research, a lot of people outside of the U.S. know two languages. And it's like we're the yeah. only ones that really don't push two languages to be fluent in. Yeah, we are behind. <laughs> yes, we, we are. And, and like I said, I'm not a big fan of the, uh, you know, I call it the American indoctrination system. What happens to our children every day because, you know, they, they come out of school, they don't learn nothing. Like I say, when you when they all, they talk about Africa, they, they talk about Africa like it's one complete, um, you know, country. That's the way they refer to it. I wish it was. It would be great if it was, but you know, they have time. They only teach them that there's what 55 countries on the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, yeah, we, uh, we, we have this insulated type of system to where, you know, that, and that, that affects the travel as well, because statistically out of the 300 million Americans, only 22% hold a passport. And out of that 22%, only 3% of those passport holders travel to Africa yearly. So that's that's the entire continent. So a lot of these misconceptions of Africa, are, we, we get them from mainstream media. So it's important for us to go because going to Africa, it changed the narrative of Africa and it um, changed. And that's like really social responsibility because you can't allow the certain this, this small pool of people or institutions to be able to, to to spread these false narratives of an entire continent and these people that are, are definitely resourceful and, and make the world go round because all these other countries come to Africa and, and take their natural resources. You know, China is, is investing in, in going to Africa and just investing billions of dollars into taking the natural resources so they can fuel their economy. 
you know, the cell phones wouldn't even be made if it wasn't from natural materials that come from the Congo. So it's like, it's interesting that people talk so bad about Africa, but we, the world wouldn't function without Africa. Right, and I've said that before. Af Africa don't need nobody else, but everybody else need Africa. That's just point blank. And, you know, we was posting a lot of our pictures, and, and we're going to post, you know, our video of our travels um, in Ethiopia. A lot of people was like, I couldn't believe that's there. And they were just, just excited. And, and, and you know, I kept telling them, I said, yeah, this is a nice mud hut, isn't it? Because, you know, in America, they try to tell you, oh, everything is warlords and poverty and mud huts. And so, you know, when you debunk that, and I feel it is our responsibility as, you know, definitely African-Americans to travel there and um, show, hey, the people are lying. Because, like, when you know when you went there as African nations, you had, like you said, you had white people all in there. You had Asians in there. I mean, all, all these other groups, but African Americans, right? Yeah, it's it's definitely um, interesting. Uh, and then, like, like I say, what, what you just to touch on what you just said, that war, poverty, and famine is always the narrative about Africa. And then when you go, you'll be surprised. You know, you know, I was I took a, and in my even people that have been there, they still like kind of gradually buy into these misconceptions because I remember I was doing a mountain biking and I took a picture in front of a mountain with some bushes and some rocks and, and, uh, and trees behind me. And then I sent the picture to my mother and she said, be, her response was, be careful of some wild animals. And I was really in the city, just on a, on a farmland doing, on a mountain bike trail. And I, and I laugh and tell her that this, I'm not close to any lions. I'm not, this is, you know, there's not wild lions running around everywhere in Africa. So, it's, you know, it's still even for us. We still, like, buy into the to the madness. That's why people like yourself, you know, it's very, very important. that You know, you put out the videos, you show people, because as, you know, you get educated, those those lies and misconceptions can definitely go down. Uh, now, you mentioned China earlier. Have you been to China uh, in, in your travels? Yes, I, I've, been to, I've been to Macau, Hong Kong, and Guangzhou. Okay, Guangzhou. I heard it's a it's a big African population in Guangzhou. It it is. So back in the day before I became worldwide date, I used to sell sneakers and clothes out of my car. And so I had um would, would buy stuff on Ali I had a friend that lived in Shenzhen and then I had got another connect in, in uh Guangzhou through through Alibaba or some type of website. So my goal was to make my own similar style of Air Force One and I had um went over to, to Guangzhou. And this Chinese guy who spoke a little English, he hosted me in his house with him, his wife, and his mother, and his children. And then we went to the area where you, where they uh where they wholesale all this stuff. And then you can just see a ton of Nigerians uh, in Guangzhou, just um, you know, just out there, just um, having businesses and everything. And, that, and there's 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 black expats that live in China as well. <clears throat> and uh, so you see a lot of Africans. All, especially Nigerians, like everywhere in the world, you can see, you can find them in Tokyo. I mean, you, you name it, the Nigerians are there. I mean, and, and other African people of other African nations as well. But Nigeria is the most populous nation in Africa, so they they get out. Yeah. So how how are you outside of that family that hosted you and which was which was you know cool for them to do that? Um, how how were you received in in, in China? Like you know uh, because. We we hear a lot of things, you know. I've covered stories where they had the museum with the monkeys next to the black people pictures, and you have the black face that's going on a lot of Ch you know some of these Chinese media plays that we've covered. I mean, what's the overall uh, perception of uh, African Americans when you get there? Well, I, last time I was there was in, in two thousand nine, mm -hmm. so experience was I had a great time, uh, but. You know, as the thing is, when you travel to certain places, it's going to be hit or miss what your experience is because you're there in a, in a tourist bubble, and then you're not you're not intertwined in the everyday life, and then noticing the nuances of the, the racism that may uh, be presented to you if you live there on a 24-hour basis. So, I have a friend, um, a good friend of mine. He he in Mandarin, China, um, uh, lived in China for years and he would tell me different stories but i but it's hard for a tourist to experience that if you're not like there day to day and then going to the like everyday places like a post office or, or a grocery store on a regular where people that may not be uh, as sensitive to understand like or be as educated to know like to not have that racism come out 
then they um, you, you'll be you'll interact with those type of people on a more, on a higher scale than being in places that are used to uh, hosting tourists and and um, from all over the world and having to be sensitive to other people's you know in um, feelings and and being cordial to people so if when you when you're traveling and you're staying within those tourist areas the likelihood of you experiencing racism I feel is is going to be less likely unless you just unless you just come across those unique experiences where you do meet that racist person and they have no decorum and no sensitivity to you being a tourist and don't realize the ramifications of you going and using your platform to to talk about your racist experience or negative experience that you may have right so let me ask you you know uh, one more question here uh, out of all the countries that you travel to what country would you say Oh, I'm not going to go back there. Panama. <laughs> Panama. Okay, what happened in Panama? Man, I, it was just they don't they don't they make their money off the canal and, and shipping, so they don't have they didn't put a lot of money into the tourism. So at the time I was really just looking to try to do in a short period of time I wanted to do some extreme adventure travel stuff and they just didn't have the the, the support to do it. So I went to um you know, the, the, the public transportation system to get the other side of town wasn't that great. Uh, you know, you have to travel far to the other end of the, of the country, like to Boco, Bocas del Toro to really, really see the white sand beaches and everything. So Panama City in the central part of the country, I just wasn't a, a fan of. And um, and, I, and I was, that was my experience back in 2000, probably 2009 as well. But I, I'm not, when people get excited about Panama, I'm not, I'm not that excited, but I think that if I go back with the right person and, you know, in my state of mind now, t over 10 years later, I'll probably enjoy it, but I'm not rushing to book a ticket to Panama right now. I, I hear you. I hear you. So, uh, Nate, could you tell people how to get in contact with you? Maybe they have some questions about different countries uh, that we didn't get to today. Yeah, I can be reached on social media at Worldwide Nate. I'm really active on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Then you have my website, which is www.worldwidenate.com. So Worldwide Nate is, is Worldwide, N-A-T-E. So uh, if you type in Worldwide Nate in Google anywhere, I will pop up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, make sure to follow him on Instagram. Go to his website, check it out. I've been to his website. Um, it's put together very well. And, uh, Nate, you know, safe uh, travels on the next one. Um, you know, be careful definitely out here in America. You know how it is for us. It's, it's black men. It's a jungle out here. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>